The Problems of Psychology, 1952. In pondering the problems of psychology, I will refrain from speaking of the soul according to the usages of those persons who have floated a doctrine of psychology, whose soul connection with the genuine science of the soul is a matter of mere semantics. These psychologists ordinarily while away their hours investigating the connections that exist between sensory experience and neurological processes, or else they ponder thinking, feeling, and willing, which are quite discrete processes. Although our psychologists seldom seem to be able to grasp this fact. A more authentic concept of the soul has existed since the dawn of Western thought, the ramifications of which are founded upon the hypothesis that man's nature comprises a threefold or triadic structure whose components are body, soul, spirit. This doctrine constitutes one of the loftiest achievements of philosophical speculation among the ancient Greeks, and no subsequent thinker who has endeavoured to evade the vital truth embodied in this idea of the threefold has met with the slightest success in his philosophizing. In fact, the threefold has been a constant theme throughout the history of philosophy, at times becoming buried beneath obscure formulae, but nevertheless enduring in one avatar or another from the ancient Greeks through the Middle Ages, and even beyond that tragic and blind age that convinced itself, as well as posterity, that such metaphysical niceties had, with one fell blow been rendered obsolete upon the discovery of the philosophical system, elaborated by the French mathematician and philosopher Descartes, whose predilection for dualistic schemes encouraged him to devise a doctrine that presented the world and man himself as divided between a bodily or spatial half and a spiritual or thinking half. There have been several significant campaigns mounted in the post-Cartesian epoch, whose proponents laboured to revive a theoretical analogy of the tripartition scheme advanced by the Greek philosophers. For instance, an unconscious attempt to bridge the gap between ancient Greek speculations and modern thought was undertaken by Goethe himself during the course of his investigations in the field of biology, and these studies were subsequently de developed refined and systematized by the philosophers of the German Romantic movement. In the afterglow of the Romantic noontide, however, the soul either disappeared completely from the precincts of psychological research, or it was grotesquely confused with some other entity whose true nature was utterly alien to that of the soul. I believe that I can justly claim, on the basis of the relevant research that I have conducted over several decades, that I have been able to establish the reality of this threefold or triadic division of man's being upon a rigorous scientific foundation. And I believe also that I have achieved my results with such interpretive exactitude that we can now determine with great precision what proportion of our nature stems predominantly from the soul, what proportion from the body, and what proportion finally stems from the spirit. Wherever we go today, we hear a lot of empty babbling about primordial mankind, er mention, in spite of the fact that no one has ever encountered such a being. There have indeed been prehistorical tribes, falsely called primitives, such as the prehistorical people to whom the Greeks gave the name Pelasgians, whose reign was ended by the great flood that preceded the advent of Deucalion and Pyrrha and whose descendants became known as the tribe of Deucalion, or the Hellenes. And finally we have the historical peoples in the proper sense, to those ever-mounting numbers we ourselves belong. Nevertheless, that which we have briefly alluded to as the Pelasgian race, was somehow able to transmit a meaningful portion of its influence to the generations that survived its disappearance from the historical record. And indeed, traces of this unique culture have endured even unto our own generation, such as the Pelasgians' symbols, cults, myths, and other barely intelligible ritual observances.
For all of the three races that we have mentioned, as well as for the prehistoric tribal groupings, the spirit is consistently regarded as being linked to a particular individual. Just as we refer to a particular person's capacity for reflective cognition, however, we must now thrust this notion of reflective consciousness into the background of our discussion so that we may direct our attention to the very different type of process. The necessity for this procedure reveals itself most clearly when we attempt to explain just what it is that we feel differentiates man from the animal, and what emerges with crystal clarity when we examine the thousandfold experiences and observations that fill the record is the obvious fact that the animal is devoid of spirit, in the precise sense in which we always employ that word. In fact, the animal organism represents the purest manifestation of the body-soul polarity to be discovered within the natural world. In utilising the word polarity, I am drawing attention to a process that is unrelated to the causal nexus, for neither are bodily processes the causes of physical ones, nor are the psychical processes the causes of the bodily ones. In fact, this falsely dualistic scheme of causality was the very rock upon which Cartesian philosophy suffered its well-deserved shipwreck. There was even less truth, unfortunately, in a later theory that briefly found favour, which held, first, that the psychical, naturally confused with the spiritual, and the body inhabit two completely discrete realms, and second, in numerous instances, a higher power introduces itself into the human organism in order to establish some type of connection between the psychical and the body. The true state of affairs is that the connection between the soul and the body is even more intimate than has ever been suspected since nothing can transpire on the side of the body that does not coincide with an event on the side of the soul, just as no event transpires on the side of the soul without a corresponding event on the side of the body. In other words, the body and the soul subsist in a polar connection, and the most concise formula that we can devise in order to express these relations is the body is the phenomenal manifestation of the soul, just as the soul is the meaning of the living body. This can also be expressed by analogy. Interpretation discloses the lexical meaning of a word, but the word is the external or phenomenal manifestation of an inner meaning. When we ponder the causal grounds whereby we have established the validity of the substrate concept, or, to put this somewhat less technically, when we employ our critical judgment in seeking answers as to the true nature of this substrate, we must bear in mind every distinction between essences that we have drawn, as well as every definition of terms that we have formulated. Now, the body reveals itself in sensuous contacts and in its reaction to such contacts, and this undisputed fact alone conclusively demonstrates that the body possesses only the most tenuous of connections to the phenomenon of distance. The soul, on the other hand, expresses its nature in vision, which enables the bearer of soul to focus upon purposeful behaviour in the furtherance of achieving certain ends, just as one's urges are obviously under the permanent sway of one's feelings. Let us introduce an illustration which may facilitate a comprehension of these matters. The stork in Mecklenburg has no need to acquire a road map in order to undertake the journey of thousands of kilometres that takes it back to its African habitat. They are only following instincts, it is often said. However, although instinct is a word that everybody employs, it is in fact a word that conceals far more than it reveals. As we proceed on our everyday round, in the course of which we recognise the world and seek to conduct our affairs within that world, we have allowed ourselves to forget that instinct has its source in an unconscious mode of recognition, 
that regulates with absolute certainty the constitution of its bearer, just as it regulates to some degree every terrestrial organism, and we must of course include ourselves in that grouping, the foundation upon which are established the bonds connecting an unreflective reaction with a distant goal is the soul. The foundation upon which are established the bonds connecting an unreflective reaction with a distant goal is the soul. Let us charitably ignore the great prejudice that seems to inflate the breasts of those who believe themselves to be endowed with unique abilities due to the status as bearers of soul. However, we mentioned a moment ago that there is not inconsiderable disadvantage connected with the nature of the animal. Specifically, the incontrovertible fact that the animal's inner life is almost completely confined to its drive impulses, just as the animal is confined to its destined environment under the constraints imposed by its evolutionary station. However, even within the soul of the animal there occurs a rudimentary collaboration between its near sense physical contact, and its innate capacity for far-seeing, sense of sight. Just as the animal is able to make certain behavioural adjustments or accommodations in response to transformations in his environment, although some organisms of course are more accommodating and hence more viable than other organisms. Thus, we come to realise that even the most talented of the animals possess a capacity for far-seeing that is immeasurably inferior to that of man, and the crucial distinction that has to be drawn between the animal and primordial man is that only man is receptive to the ever-transforming visions of spaces and times, just as he is indifferent as to whether these visions do or do not originate in his urges. In sharp contrast with the animal, his inner world is that of the far-seeing soul and not that of the narrowly constricted proximity in which bodily contacts, sense of touch, can occur. The development of this far-seeing capacity extends through the millennia, and the details as to the specifics of this development can be no more than rough approximations. But then something utterly unprecedented transpired. For, into the substance of man erupted the lightning bolt of spirit, a daemonic force that invades man and world from a realm outside the spatio-temporal realm. The progressive development of spirit took place by incremental steps that remorselessly potentiated the hypertrophic development of goal-oriented volition in man, conscious purpose, and finally, the will to business. This sinister tendency has now become a blatantly destructive will to plunder the living world. However, at the dawn of history, and for many subsequent generations, spirit existed in a creative symbiosis with the soul. In the course of time, the balance of the poles shifted more and more towards the dominance of spirit over the soul. That development has continued all the way down to the present age. Among every people that we consider to be civilized, spirit eventually severs its ties with the soul. Grand ideas and technological discoveries have, of course, produced certain desired results, but these advances have brought a new danger in their wake. Modern man's conscious striving for power far surpasses that of any previous epoch. Today, every nation is drawn deeper and deeper into the striving for dominance, without which each nation believes that it must ultimately perish. I am thinking less of the frightful wars that we must henceforth endure, and more of the disturbing fact that within all peoples, this lust for power has so infected the most diverse groups that it has fastened manacles upon life itself. Woman has always been the mother and nurturer of her house, 
but today she sees herself so overburdened by the demands of her career that she is threatened with the forfeiture of one of her deepest missions in life, namely to serve life by becoming the guardian and protector of life and tradition. One result of this dreadful process is that man is now in danger of losing his traditional connections with his family, just as he's endangered by the conflicts that poison the relations between employer and employee, conflicts that are interrupted by truces that have only just been declared when the rancorous hostilities erupt anew. In the service of human needs, the ever-increasing mechanisation has brought about the desecration of the natural world. Just recall how many species of wildlife have been annihilated by man during the last 15 years alone. And finally, we must realise that behind all of this obsessive striving for power to which we have alluded, the most gigantic, and at the same time the most destructive, is that for which we can find no more appropriate name than business. While our philosophers drivel away their hours in desiccated dialectical disputations that result in nothing more significant than hair-splitting irrelevancies, money has conquered the world, and there can no longer be any doubt that the vital power whose throne has been usurped by gold, namely the soul, is now threatened by imminent destruction. I became convinced of the validity of these perceptions many years ago, and ever since that time I have sought to communicate my feelings in brief essays, as well as in comprehensive treatises. Treatises. However, not even the strict adherence to philosophical principles, which has forced me to proclaim the unvarnished truth about these matters to my readers, will suffice to terminate the dangerous entity that menaces the living organism. For the dreadful things that our eyes can see are but the external reflections of perilous internal transformations that are ravaging the deepest substratum of the living organism. It is precisely at this substrate level that we situate the destructive operations of that more than human power whose goal is the ultimate annihilation of the soul itself. <laughs>